Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 57, and this is part two of my most recent conversation with Bernardo Castrup. And I will keep this very brief, uh, as this doesn't really require setup since this is part two, but a big thanks to any of you who watch this, and a big, a special thanks to those of you who are subscribed to the channel and uh, view the content and engage with the, with the show. Thank you very much, and enjoy this part two. And welcome back to the IdeaCast interview series, YouTube viewers. Uh, those of you who are uh, coming here and you didn't see the first part, I'd suggest um, if you're finding this just as a recommendation on um, on the YouTube algorithms, you'll see a part two, go back, find part one. That's uh, um, They're not directly contiguous, the conversations, but uh, it would be good to listen to what we said earlier. So anyway, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, Bernardo. I'm so glad uh, we can have a, a second conversation and continue um, the beautiful mind flow that we're doing here, uh, at least on my end, it's beautiful mind flow. Um, <laughs> So what I'd like to do is um, we we closed something out earlier and in the first conversation. And so I want to start with um, when when you do your work, um, a lot of the people that you uh, not a lot, some of the people that you work with uh, historically, and we're going to bring one of them in in a, in a little bit, uh, the Nicholas von Kues, who I'm really uh, excited to talk to you about, um, have been informed by Neoplatonism. So the mystics, uh, the Ibn Arabi, and I uh, mentioned uh, um, Marguerite Poiret earlier. She was she was delivered to a, a Celtic monastery, which is speculated that they were influenced by Neoplatonism. How much of a role does the um, Plotinus' structure of Neoplatonism work with you directly or are you getting it if anything at all more through the others who because a lot of work seems to be informed by that idea of the one the noose the psyche and the soul which i think is a wonderful trinitarian perspective and it's informed christianity and islam and judaism do you are you impacted directly by some of that or is it is it just a, a faint background um bit of of what's going on with your work and what inspires you it's very difficult to say what has impacted me directly or not. Um, with my mind of today, I would say no. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not directly impacted <clears throat> by Neoplatonism. Um, it's something that <clears throat> informed mostly the Gnostics, informed alchemy. Um, it has a lot of mythical flourishing, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't Poo poo! I don't dismiss. I think there is a role for all, for all that, but my disposition, at at least uh, as an adult, is not well aligned with the mythical embellishments. Um, I appreciate it privately, mm -hmm. but uh, when it comes down to putting a position forward, I I rather like the the sort of a, you know, explicit, clear, to the point, um, without embellishments okay. as uh, as few embellishment embellishments uh, as i can get away with very direct very to the point so i wouldn't say that today it informs me directly in neoplatonism mm -hmm. uh, indirectly it does because it has informed jung and jung has informed me uh, the case is still not clear regarding schopenhauer mm -hmm. neoplatonism but neoplatonism informed the alchemists for sure and that's uh, a very significant part of European history. Arguably, it has influenced all areas of knowledge in Europe, including medicine, mm -hmm. uh, certainly chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I am impacted by it as anybody in the Western tradition is, but not specially impacted by it, no. Okay. One of my motives, and I have a couple of motives in asking that because it does seem to be an anchor or a uh, foundation for a lot of um, the intellectual side of um, talking about things that come up when, when you're talking and so forth and delivering uh, your uh, perspectives on things. Not again, not, not the core distillation of your ontology or your metaphysics or whatever, but just some of the things that come in. Um, firstly would be that of um that trinity that i spoke of and so there is the one which i would then say is the um underlying field of subjectivity or the mind at large 
Um, and this is all just a heuristic. It's a sort of means to understand its language, its signifiers. And so, and so with the one, then they have the intermediary layer of the noose, and then there is the psyche or the soul. And um, that's kind of where I am. I think ensoulment equals con access consciousness in a functional human being. I don't believe in a soul that you know, moves on after we die. It's just that this is the ensoulment now. Um, and then, so the noose is attractive to me and understanding as we were hitting on a little earlier in our first uh, part one conversation that um, the instinctual nature of the mind at large is incapable of intercessional behavior or intervening behavior or um, interactive behavior as we were speaking of the dashboard earlier. And so um, strictly for a, a, a metaphoric, means of understanding our relationship with reality and that the noose is attractive in that sense or whatever you want to call it it could be the demiurge it could be uh some super uber daimon or something you know that that is the intermediary uh between the psyche the soul the intellect of the uh, metacognitive ape uh and the um ineffable the void the unexplainable the underlying field of subjectivity so do you see a value in uh, to get to a point do you see the value in, in an intermediary layer um that could be purely abstract it could not have any ontic foundation necessarily but it is our means to try to stay grounded in a relationship with the ineffable that cannot speak to us that cannot it's a, that from our perspective that we cannot interact with or have access to does that make yes, sense i i see the value i think that value would play more if we find ourselves incapable of making sense of certain empirical observations based purely on the notion of a non-self-reflective, -self uh, non-judging um, underlying field of subjectivity across all reality. So what could, what could be difficult to explain if that's all we assume? All, it's all about this one underlying field. You could argue that uh, the fine-tuning problem is difficult to solve unless there is some kind of metacognitive deity mm -hmm. with a plan, yeah. or at least an intermediary like the demiurge of Neoplatonism, uh, which has fallen like Satan mm -hmm. fell and has become metacognitive <clears throat> and set this up according to the fine-tuning. So under the hypothesis that we cannot make sense of the fine-tuning of the universal constants, in any naturalistic way, I think there would be value to that. That's one instance. Do I think that we are there today? No, I don't think so. I think we can make sense of the fine tuning in purely naturalistic means. Mm -hmm. I think um, the physical world is constructed. It's the dashboard. Um, it has been constructed by evolution as our interface to what is. Um, but the physical world is not absolute. It's it's constructed, like dashboards are constructed, constructed by evolution. And then, of course, the dashboard would be constructed constructed in such a way that our existence within the world represented by the dashboard is possible. And the only way for that to be the case is the fine tuning. So the dashboard has been constructed in such a way that fine fine tuning is the case, mm -hmm. because the dashboard would be self defeating if it informed us about the world in such a way that our existence would not make sense within it. Mm -hmm. You see? So I think we can account for the fine tuning in naturalistic ways. And therefore we do not need the hypothesis of the demiurge. Another possibility, and that is more, more difficult to refute or even ignore, is that uh, many of the end years, the near death experiencers that I do take seriously, uh, like uh, even Alexander, mm -hmm. who I think in his reports, he, he has all the hallmarks of an, uh, an authentic report of somebody who is not trying to make up stuff mm -hmm. uh, because he, he even leaves uh, the aspects of the experience that could be exploited by the opposition to try to refute uh, the experience. He, he leaves those in. So I think his report is transparent and authentic. Um and what you notice in the in these reports of people of you know, reports that I consider trustworthy is that although your personal human self seems to cease to exist, 
your personal identity as a little human ceases to exist, you don't go back to some form of oceanic uh, postnatal consciousness or prenatal, prenatal consciousness. There is something in between. There is a self, uh, a differentiated self. It's not a human, little dissociated human. It's, it's something broader, more diffused than that. But it's not the whole either. It's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. If you take those reports seriously, which I do, I, 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 I don't dismiss them. I, I, I dismiss a whole lot of ND reports, but not yeah. all of them. I think it's, it would be a statistical <clears throat> impossibility, but almost if, at least extremely unlikely statistically that all these people are either making things up or being completely deluded. Yeah. Uh, and then you need a sort of a, a fallback, an intermediary level between full dissociative state as being human and non-dissociated at all as being the whole of the universe. There, there seems to be something people reporting between. Um, and then the notion of, I don't know, a demiurge or intermediate levels uh, or the fractal expression of the pleroma with the hierarchy of uh, uh, angels and, yeah. and, and demons um, that could provide some kind of mythical illustration of what might be going on. Uh, but at this point, I'm not too tempted to explore that. No, I, I okay. think we are okay without it. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't th even think about the fine tuning when it comes to this um, transitional or liminal space <clears throat> between the void or the um, core layer of subjectivity and what the so-called reality that we seem to in inhabit. Um, it's almost like for me, um, fine tuning is a non-starter, partly out of ignorance, but partly out of, like you say, sometimes it, it's just, this is what it is. This is how it is expressing itself. This is how it is coming into being. Um, and so I was thinking of the role of the intermediary again as um, let's just so we'll go back to something I asked earlier in the first part of our conversation um, that if there is progress, if that which is the mind at large um, is learning anything through us, it is if it is developing um, something through us, whatever that of is. Course. Yeah. So I take very seriously that idea that it is both ineffable and non-material, non-spatio temporarily, it's not an obligate to anything that we are, uh, that we express. So it's, so this is where language gets tricky and sticky. And you say this too, um, that, that if there is this liminal space or, or liminal non-space, whatever it is that's going on, that that might help to understand if there is any progress being made by these self-reflective apes going through the drama of life and the suffering of life um yeah I, I i don't i don't know if i have a question in that it's just that um it seems to help us understand how you can go from purely instinctual almost void uh or void or whatever to to the richness of of what's going on and so i'm not looking for a telos necessarily i think i'm looking for um ontological layers uh that you know we can make sense of to not necessarily again satisfy the knowing of the ineffable but more if we want to apply a teleology to say that this thing this whatever is progressing through us uh, that it's so in other words uh you reference like when a person passes that my little way of thinking about is that all the experience that i've like you know the reaper analogy everything i've ever experienced is imprinted or something is transferring and Justin is gone. He's toast. And I'm good with that because I do not want to be me beyond this corporeal experience. Like, you know, if, if I am that, which is just manifesting in a whirlpool or an eddy of dissociation, that's great. Um, but like I said, it's just as a heuristic, as a, as a way for us to ground ourselves in sense-making, meaning-making, purpose-making, all that kind of thing. I just wanted to get your, your, your take on, um, the plausibility of there being this liminal um, stage or space or whatever you want to call it. I don't think we need to postulate it to understand how human life can contribute to the cognitive richness of nature. Um, if anything, it's easier to understand that without the intermediary layer. Okay. Because if, if we are dissociated mechanisms that uh, when represented on a dashboard look like living bodies, if that's what we are, then death is the end of the dissociation, since it's the end of the living, breathing, metabolizing body. 
And then whatever cognitive perspectives or insights or whatever cognitive content you have accumulated within the boundaries of the dissociation throughout your life are then directly released into the most fundamental layer of nature. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's easier to understand telos that way than to say, oh, now our insights are then sort of caught in a net that is a, that sits at an intermediary layer. And then there is a hierarchy of layers in which, you know, those that cognitive richness is passed on until it reaches, you know, what religion would call the Godhead. Mm -hmm. I think it's more <clears throat> difficult to understand Tilos that way. Um, it may be more compatible with uh, religious mythology throughout history, which I do take seriously. I think mm -hmm. religious mythology embodies a lot of intuitive philosophical insights that people have had. Uh, which is not surprising because we are part of nature. We are grounded in nature. It's not surprising that we have valid intuitive insights about nature. Um, but uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't think from an analytic perspective, it is necessary for us to speak of telos that there be an intermediate intermediate layer. No. Okay. Now, this uh, is a good segue <clears throat> for things that you've mentioned over the last few years. Um in your own sort of prognostication of what will happen when Bernardo Castro dies, as you've mentioned, having a bit of anxiety about staring into the eternal uh, void or the abyss or however you want to phrase it. I'm misphrasing it, but uh, you know what I'm saying. And yeah. so that and so two questions in there. You alluded to something in the latter part of 2022, saying that um, this may be a manifestation of Bernardo's psyche uh, having to face that. And so it may not be a one-to-one -one mapping of what really happens, but that this could be a fear of yours. But also I, I put some value in that, in that saying that, you know, maybe when it's lights out, when I get hit by a truck uh, and I'm gone, that, 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 that transition from being the egoic metacognitive, that this thing uh, to reassimilating, to um, associating and so instead of disassociating, um, can you can you open that up a little bit and talk about what your concerns are in staring into the uh, to the void uh, like that? Yeah, I call it your the vertigo of eternity. Vertigo of eternity. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I don't think we are things. Mm -hmm. I think we are processes, dissociative processes. Uh, what we refer to as ourselves is something nature is doing. It's something that underlying field of subjectivity <clears throat> that is nature uh, is doing. We are doings. We are verbs. Mm -hmm. um, so death is not an ontological transition from one form of being to another form of being. Okay. I think before and after death, we are exactly the same thing. What we will be after death is what we are right now. Okay. Being is unchanged. What changes is a state of mind. I think the body is what a particular state of mind in the mind of nature looks like. Just like uh, when you're on drugs, your patterns of brain activity look different. And there is an image of, of you being on drugs. And then mm -hmm. Your patterns of mental activity on drugs look like something discernible under an fMRI scanner. Mm -hmm. uh, in, this, in exactly the same way, the particular pattern of mental activity that we refer to as ourselves looks like something, and it happens to be the body. So if the body is no longer breathing, it's no longer metabolizing, it means the image changed. And if that image is the image of a mental process or a mental state, then the mental state changes. And I think that's what, that's what death is. We are the same thing we are right now. We will always be this because that's what nature is. But that state of mind changes. Now, we know from experience with psychedelic drugs, that a, a profound change in your state of mind can be both exhilarating and it can be terrifying. Mm -hmm. In either case, you are what you are. You, yeah. you, you didn't cease to be what you already were. What you are right now is what you're, what you're going to be 100 years from now after Justin is dead. Mm -hmm. um, but that mental state called Justin will not be the case. And that means that there is a state <clears throat> transition. And state transitions uh, in the phenomenology of mind are known to carry the potential for um, disturbance and, uh, and difficulty. Uh, psychedelics are well known for this. Um, uh, what people call ego dissolution, which is mm -hmm. a, it's a state transition. After the transition is done, you're fine. 
And um, when you go to that egoless state in a psychedelic, in a deep high dose psychedelic trance, uh, getting into it is is, is excruciating. Uh, you know that transition of state is excruciating. But once you are through, then I I, I couldn't even call it bliss. It's 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 not even bliss. It, it's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And what is then difficult is to come back. That subsequent transition, which I I like to call the re-entry, mm -hmm. uh, coming back to space-time, to limitation, is is beyond excruciating. It's the reason I no longer do psychedelics for many years. Mm -hmm. It's not the ego dissolution. I'm, I'm a pro on ego dissolution right now. Uh, having done it so many times, it's it's like I know what's coming. I know what it means. I don't stress out. I don't impose that suffering on myself. I completely let go because mm -hmm. I know what it's going to go. Um, the return I never could make peace with. Mm -hmm. uh, it puts me in a place in which <clears throat> for three weeks I don't want to live. Mm -hmm. um, and and you you know it, it comes to a point where you you start taking decisions that avoid those three weeks <laughs> very naturally. Yeah. Um, but in the case of ego dissolution, it I'm a pro now because I know what to expect, but I I don't remember death. I don't know what to expect. So rationally speaking, I think it's reasonable to expect that that major transition in mental state carry a tremendous potential for stress. Yeah. And okay. of that, I'm afraid. Absolutely. Yeah. If I were a materialist, like I sort of was unthinkingly mm -hmm. many years ago, it wouldn't bother me the least. Where I am, death is not. Where death is, I am not. So what is there to fear? But now as an idealist, yeah, I fear. How how would one how would you console yourself given that <clears throat> perspective? Um that you know it will pass, even though you're now timeless and, and unbound. Um that so I'm trying no, to work it, through it, it, it's part of the adventure, right? Yeah. We yeah. suffer in life too, not only when we die. Yeah. So and this goodness so... knows there's stuff in life that is worse than dead. Than that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the process of dying <laughs> it can take weeks, and you're rotting even from before, the inside. Even before that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. So okay, I, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And and I know I and I, and it's been forever since I've done psychedelics. Um, but yeah, for a couple of days afterwards, whether it was mushrooms or LSD, I called them serotonin hangovers, and you just felt like shit. You know, it was kind of the opposite of because I used to love taking threshold doses of LSD. I called them empath checks because I could be very sociopathic in a sense. Um, not, not pathological, but subclinically and just like, you know, really just, um, not in touch with my humanity. And that helped to reconnect me because I would fall in love with a lot of things artificially. And, but I could bring that back with me, but like I said, you just said, I, I could feel well, pretty shitty. You could shitty. argue that artificial, what is artificial is now on serotonin, which is also a drug. You're always on drugs. You oh yeah. Avoid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's enhanced. Let's put it that way. You know, LSD gave me that little shot, but I used to love doing that. I wouldn't take, I took real pretty high doses occasionally. And I didn't, you know, it was okay. It's fun. The first, you know, when you're 16 and you're doing it, it's great. And everything, you know, like this painting behind me, but you know, beyond that, I would take it sort of more therapeutically and I would do probably 60 micrograms or whatever, uh, once a month and, uh, and just get in touch with myself and feel, uh, human and feel, um, like I cared, you know, and that helped bring me through kind of you know, the, the rough 20 somethings, you know, when we're all in angst and all that kind of thing. And the same thing with mushrooms, you know, it just brought me more in touch uh, along with the laughs and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so, um, so the um, one other thing in the, in, in the same ballpark that we're talking about, is you've mentioned in the past that in the reentry with psychedelics, that there is a kind of access or a um, tamping down of the egoic executive aspect and more the flowy um stream of kind that's of when you shoot out that that's when you're going there right right but you so talked about playing no you've talked about playing chess and re-entry and that you have access yes. to not the the analytical mind as much but more the intuitive what if, if that's yeah. right yeah the and intuitive so, mind yeah. yeah 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 and is that a discipline that could be harnessed i wonder or is it just you, you just know you just it has to spontaneously arise either through the help of assistance of uh, serotonin agonists or uh, maybe mindfulness. Do you think that's oh, something no. that can be disciplined that can be harnessed? Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm not one of those who say, oh, nothing artificial. I mean, uh, 
artificial stuff is what we make and we are part of nature <laughs> no 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 no. i'm not trying to add a negative connotation to the term artificial i'm just saying there's mindfulness where you can be a buddhist monk and you can meditate 400 hours a year or whatever and get some sort of access to a greater flowy kind of um, apprehension of reality or you can take lsd either in super doses or or mushrooms and you know what i mean and 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 have a different way of processing information that, yeah, yeah, that's I, it I'm not a dualist, so I don't make any fundamental distinction between a meditation session and, and swallowing a pill. Mm -hmm. Because in my view of nature, everything is mental. What we call physical yeah. is a representation of the mental beyond the dissociative boundary. So that pill that you swallow, it's not physical. It's a representation right. of a transpersonal mental process that you are bringing into contact with your own cognition, your own dissoci dissociated cognition. And that has, guess what, a cognitive effect, of course. Mm -hmm. If you bring two different cognitive processes in contact, they interact and they lead to changes. You know, Synthesis. If you have a bad thought, you have a bad emotion. Two different right. cognitive processes that right. causally affect one right. another. So I'm perfectly <sighs> okay if somebody finds out a pill that is long-term safe to use, not toxic to your organism, uh, with uh, acceptable levels of side effects, and that enhance the capacity of our intuitive mind, I'm perfectly okay with that. Let us all go for it. Mm -hmm. The question is, is it really safe? Let's make sure it is safe. Let's do all the testing. Let's do all the careful science before we start using it. But I don't have any a priori protest against taking psychoactive medicines. I, I take, I have a, a very strong tinnitus both mm -hmm. years. Sounds like a you know a dentist's drill yeah, to meters got, distance. Yeah, to my right ear. Oh, my, yeah, yeah it's I nasty. have it in stereo. I used to have uh, it only on one side, uh, and stereo is much worse. One is bad enough. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's something that has driven me to contemplate suicide for half an hour twice. Yeah, uh, very. I mean, I don't want to explain to people how bad it is because I don't want to plant this thought in anybody's mind. It's yeah. a very, it's a bad condition that we have no cure for. Yeah. Um, but there is one psychoactive drug called amitriptyline that in some patients is known to reduce the level of tinnitus. Lo and behold, that's my case. Mm -hmm. My tinnitus is one quarter of what it would be without amitriptyline, uh, which is an, a first generation antidepressant, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't take because I'm depressed. I take because of the tinnitus. Yeah. Um, but I find that it helps me in many other aspects of life. It has a bad side effect, which is to put on weight. I am now weighing 90 kilos. What I should weigh is 81, 82 okay. from my height. I'm 186 mm -hmm. meters, six foot one and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm overweight because of this thing. It's a known side effect. Um, another bad side effect is that it uh, compromises my memory for names. I find it difficult now to remember names, but I remember everything else. So I'm not cognitively compromised in, in any other sense. And uh, I sing the praises to this. Now we know that the fact that one psychoactive drug works for you doesn't mean that it works for everybody else because we are all unique individuals, individuals. And our science has not progressed enough to even understand how these drugs actually work. We don't quite understand how amitriptyline does what it does. Uh, why is it an anticholinergic? What is the anticholinergic effect? Mm -hmm. I mean, we know now about, you know, receptors and the molecular keys and all that, but it's not clear how this stuff works. Yeah. So it's impossible to say it will work for everybody else. So if yeah. you have tinnitus, whoever is watching or listening to this, it's not necessarily the case that uh, if you go to your doctor and get your amitriptyline, that you will be okay. It may not work at all for you. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think uh, we should continue to do psychoactive medicines and research and psychiatry is valuable valuable i'm not one of those guys who tell you that psychiatry is all bad i mean there is a dark side to psychiatry obvious you know and even the scientific research behind for instance ssris has been very flawed marginally above placebo mm -hmm. a lot of marketing and economics in this that shouldn't be there yeah. But uh, th these are circumstantial criticisms, not fundamental criticisms against the discipline. Yeah. yeah. So I'm okay. This... And if we develop a drug that increases empathy and is safe <laughs> yeah. to use, yeah. then goodness knows we need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you <laughs> could say this. We should give a bottle to Putin, first of all. 
should be the first to try the empathy enhancing drug. Let mm. him suffer what millions of Ukrainians are suffering. Let's see if he will continue. Yeah. <laughs> I think a good shot of 5-MeO-DMT for people like that. But yeah, um, no. <laughs> and so I'm certainly not poo-pooing uh, uh, exogenic means of accomplishing something. I, absolutely. I, I have a long history of <laughs> pharmacological adventures. You know? <laughs> I, and, and I hurt myself a couple of times and I made stupid, you know, once in a while you'd make a little mistake, but you know, and I don't do, I'm sober as a judge for many years now. And, and, and uh, this is my thing now is just having conversations and think and thinking uh, is, is enough for me now. And tea, I'm drinking a little tea right now. So, that's it. But, but no, no, to, to, to clarify, I'm not poo-pooing the line between, um, say, the more natural method and 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 chemical uh, clinical interventions or chemical interventions, not at all. And and I'm with you. I was just saying this to my wife yesterday. We were driving around, and you know, they were talking about somewhere here in the United States. It's very progressively um, working with drug addicts, and so they're trying to get them off this shitty Chinese fentanyl that people don't know the difference between micrograms and nanograms and and milligrams, and and they're killing people. And and so I said to my wife, I said, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, being the opportunists that they are and, and ceaselessly pursuing revenue and new new frontiers, just do just what you said and develop uh, relatively safe, relatively low risk for addiction, um, feel good things that um, along with therapy, along with having um, counselors uh, with there to help the drug using person. And I say this in an antisocial sense of drug use, not the pro-social uh, psychedelic renaissance, that kind of thing. No, this is more people who are addicted to methamphetamine and taking that shitty fent fentanyl and heroin and all that stuff. Um, and, and finding a place where um, if someone is self-medicating and someone is compelled to use that they do that, but under the, under the strict um, uh, supervision, either of their physician or a counselor, a therapist, somebody who's certified to work with mental health, and so that you come, you take your dose or whatever, and you do some therapy sessions prior to that. And perhaps there's hope for you, but it's better than, you know, being on the streets, buying from Mexican Sinaloa cartels that do terrible things to people. And the, and again, the, the uh, millions that are being made from the importation of fentanyl into Mexico and yada, 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 the whole string, the whole string can be uh, reduced. Um, but anyway, so there's my social justice thing for a minute there, but I'm, bringing it to a point that uh yes i am absolutely in favor of assistance from our our what is again like you said it is a aspect of mind it is a third person perspective of mind that is interacting with us in a uh, in this case a synergistic way with our our neurotransmitters and so forth so yes 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 just to just to wrap that up i am not uh, saying that but what i was getting to and this this impressed me when you said this that you were playing chess on the re-entry and that the access to or the tamping down of egoic executive function and more the openness to a flow state, if you will, uh, a mental flow state um, that, that we we are immersed in, but maybe ignoring, can, again, because the egoic center is coming back online and it is telling you you're great and you can make these decisions, you know, so you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so if whether you can it's... unlock that with a drug and the drug is safe otherwise, yeah, yeah. by all means. Oh, sure. yeah. And nootropics are kind of hinting at that. That's a sort of cognitive enhancement where, you know, there's, a, uh, oh, I'm so far out of this. It's been years, but there's uh, there's GABAergic type things um, in the nootropic world. There's phenobut and uh, other uh, racetum class. It's the paracetum and uh, other types of uh, cetums that uh, you just, they work with the GABA receptors to just sort of elevate your ability to think. And if you're not an egomaniac or a narcissist, even if you are perhaps, but you know, you can, you can uh, move forward and, and uh, maybe ingest things intellectually a little better. So yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm all for that. Oh, and if you hear whistling in the background, we're pet sitting a African gray parrot for two weeks. I don't know if it's coming through <laughs> on the microphone, but there's birds in the other room, just, just having a good old conversation with us. So I don't know if it's showing up on the mic, but I apologize if it is very, very faint. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's not somebody in the room whistling. It's just this bird. It's, it's, it's interesting to watch um, this bird's behavior. They're very intelligent, you know, and, and they're watching you and they're taking in their environment. Uh, this might be a segue into animal sentience and cognition and the uh, sapiential nature of things beyond ourselves. And so I'll give a little credit to the parrot uh, for being a, a cagey creature, so to speak. And um, I don't advocate the keeping of uh, birds myself, but it's a, a, a family member who uh, entrusted the bird with us for two weeks. So it's an it's interesting experience. All right. So let's move on to um, 
somebody that you've mentioned a few times in the in the latter part of 2022 and you've been working with for a while, uh, that's Nicholas von Hughes. And I'd like to start that conversation. Um, I just did a cursory review of um, him and the work that he did in his time in the mid 15th, 15th century. So let's talk about him and, and how he's um, impressing you and um, reaching out through the centuries to collaborate with you, if you will. You you made a joke about it. you don't know, you know, you have this sort of Bernardo centric view that you've you've um, helped uh, Schopenhauer and you've helped Young uh, with your writing, not necessarily help, but collaborated with in a sense and maybe set the trajectory of interpretation uh, that that is suitable um, for whomever. Uh, so let's talk about uh, Nicholas, if we can. So Nicholas was a 15th century scholar. Um, he was born in a city in Germany uh, that today is called uh, Bernkastel, uh, Bernkastel Kues, which is a sort of merger between two cities, one on, well, villages, one mm -hmm. on either side of the river. How do you say the Oh, name I, river, I just heard it today. Mosel in Germany. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Mosel, I just Mosel, heard it. Something, yes, yeah, yeah you're close. They can yeah, look in, it up. in Dutch, it's Mosel. In, okay. in German, it's Mosel. In French, it is uh, Le, Le Moiselle. But I don't know in English. <laughs> Something that sounds... We don't, need to Eng we, don't, we don't need to anglophone it. <laughs> you know, we can just call it the Mosel. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, anyway. So... so that's two and a half hours from where I am, where, where my home is. Um, it's one of my favorite places in the world, the valley of the river Mosel. And um, Kuse is, uh, if you're going up to Kohan, Kuse is on the right bank and uh, Berncastel is on the left bank uh, of the Mosel. And um, Nicolas was born in Kuse, therefore Nicolas von Kuse, which mm -hmm. means Nicolas from Kuse. Kuse yeah. uh, he also goes by other names like uh, Nicolas de Cusa, Nicolas Cusanus, and Latinized versions of his name because in the 15th century Latin was the scholarly language people would write in, in Latin and refer to each other by Latinized names. Um, Nicholas became a bishop of the Catholic Church. He is famous for having traveled to the Near East, um, famous for having had some major philosophical insights while uh, on the boat coming back from the Near East. So he was well-traveled, well-studied. Um, he did charity. He opened what in the 15th century was something that didn't exist, which was a home for old people yeah. where they would be cared for. And that place <clears throat> still exists. I saw that. Day. I was impressed. Yeah. 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 And he had That's his amazing. office in that building. I went to his library. His library is preserved largely intact. The books he read, they are all there still unfortunately mm -hmm. i wanted to make pictures but i was not allowed oh okay to make pictures uh, it was already enough of a privilege that uh, i was allowed in there <laughs> oh sure sure absolutely <laughs> to, to peruse, peruse what uh, nicholas himself was reading uh, but it's a beautiful place it's dark like every medieval building uh, it's dark the windows are very small for security reasons mm -hmm. um, um and he spoke greatly to me i don't know i mean i'm not talking about hearing a voice in my head or anything. oh yeah yeah oh. Uh, it, it, he was close to me mm -hmm. um i almost felt like not only was i in the place where he was born i was in the very room where he was born the house where he was born still exists it has been flooded a number of times over the centuries but it still exists it's preserved by the q society um and I felt a sense of familiarity that um, was unusual. Um, I've been to Kant's grave, you know, I've, I've been to Jung's house and uh, mm -hmm. Jung's birthplace. Um, in some of these cases, I don't feel familiarity. Okay. Uh, like Kant's grave, grave was abstract to me. It's now within Russia. It mm -hmm. used to be Konigsberg. It's now Kaliningrad. It's a part of Russia. But I was there many years ago. Um, but um, Jung speaks to me, Schopenhauer speaks to me, they're very close to me, they're close, I don't know how to express this, this sense of familiarity, like it's almost like I can look at the, the world through their eyes, and that happened with uh, Nicholas, um, before I had even read a great deal about his writings, at a time when I knew only sort of the basics 
of uh, Nicholas's uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing that he was not excommunicated. Um, yeah. Um, in the 15th century, that was before the Reformation, uh, the Catholic Church was very tolerant mm. of stuff. Um, it was with the Reformation and then the Counter-Reformation, part of which was the Inquisition, that uh, intolerance came to reign in the Catholic Church when it came to philosophical ideas. Nicholas would have been burned at the stake if he had done what he had done, what, what he did uh, two centuries later, maybe mm. even one century later. Like Bruno, uh, yeah, yeah, like Bruno in 1600. But Bruno was not even a, cl a, cl a cleric, a cl part of the clergy. He was a scientist, mm -hmm. but there were members of the clergy that would have been excommunicated and and even burned for saying what Bruno, what Nicholas uh, said. So yeah, and uh, so I, I I feel a familiarity with him that I feel only with Jung, Schopenhauer with uh, Kierkegaard as well. Um, so one day, but it's a very long-term project, one day I would like to do for Nicholas uh, what I may have done for Jung and Schopenhauer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, for, and so to editorialize as a fan of your work, uh, what you did for Schopenhauer, I think, was set the record straight. And for Jung, you presented a perspective um, that ran through the lens of idealism and showed that Jung uh, implicitly perhaps was um, pointing to th uh, things in that realm. And, uh, and and like I said, Schopenhauer, you sort of uh, rescued, if you will, from the silliness that was going on, and we won't mention names, but the things that were being said, like um, dual aspect monism and things like that, you kind of clarify that. And um, so, yeah, a, a treatment of, uh, of uh, Nicholas would be a way I think to help elevate relevance um it, he's he's had a and and so it's documented that he sort of had a revival with the post-Kantonists or, or the neo-Kantonists um you know they they took to him and 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 even further into the future um that he, his work was appreciated <laughs> and some scholars the little bit again that I've, I've looked uh scholars like to informally uh see him as a bridge uh to uh, Spino uh not Spinoza um to uh Descartes um from the dark ages and from some of the scholastic uh thinking um and so yeah he's a pivotal figure historically both theologically and I think and he he also dabbled in geometry he was trying to give it a, a like um like Donald Hoffman's doing with some of what he's you guys um <laughs> what was the conversation who was the host oh it was you and Donald Hoffman oh it was like Ken can the ineffable be mathematized? And I can't remember yeah. who the host was, but you and Donald had a great conversation. And, um, uh, and wasn't uh, it uh, Kurt? Kurt Chaimongo, maybe? No, Kurt, I don't remember. No, no, but it, but it should be, you know, it's in that vein. And 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 Donald was on with Verveke, uh recently with Kurt Chaimongo. And uh, that was a really good conversation because I wasn't sure how Verveke was going to handle Donald. You, you and John had seven hours of great conversation. Um, and, and, and I think John wanted to come back and, and explore Donald's work some more. In fact, Kurt was a little bit more pushing back as a physicist on some of what Donald was saying. He's, you know, Donald slipped up a couple of times. And he says, you know, well, physicists are saying, which is, it's like, what you mean? Some, <laughs> some, some physicists are saying, but Donald says, again, he's he's a talker. He's good. He's a good uh, personality. Um, and speaking of Kurt Jaimengal, I want to give you a, a, a reference. And you've probably seen this when he brought Matt O'Dowd in. Did you see the conversation with him? Who is a, uh, uh, Matt is uh, PBS FaceTime uh the oh, series pbs space yeah, yeah. which is the, the, the bearded guy yeah he's got he's australian he has a beard he's, yeah, he's, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. he's a good guy he's a good presenter and uh, he's a he's a competent physicist if my opinion's worth anything but anyway he uh kurt brought your name up and matt o'dowd said um i really like the way and i'm paraphrasing i like the way um bernardo works with the idea of uh consciousness as a dissociation and then he went to be the good physicist and say, no, I can't follow him all the way on um, this being a consciousness only ontology. And I want to put an asterisk on that, because after we're done talking about Nicholas, we can get back to that for a second. Not necessarily Matt O'Dowd, but that sentiment. So anyway, but I think he was just being a good agnostic physicist and he can't, you know, or or carrying some of his beliefs with him when he said it. But anyway, he gave you a good uh, 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 mention. As a physicist, I would be very disappointed with him. 
if he, if he had said, yeah. And I think Bernardo is right that everything is consciousness. That's not about what the metaphysics should ever say. Yeah. Right, right. But physics at, is not metaphysics. They Matt, shouldn't go there. No, Especially no, no. a public yeah. facing physicist yeah. like the the host of space time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he and that's again, I'm I'm granting him that I think that he was being a good agnostic physicist and saying I can't follow him down that path of his uh, metaphysics. But I like the idea, probably as Matt, the human being who has these same existential questions that all of us do that put the time in that the dissociation analogy is a really well so anyway i thought that was a good compliment for matt to say that because i've been watching space time for a few years um not the old host but when he came on and i listen for things when he's talking and just to see how he handles certain things when he when they do talk about quantum physics and so forth but anyway not to go too far off on the tangent but i just wanted to say that he did give that um that mention and i thought that because kurt brought you up and uh and he said he watched the interview between you and kurt and uh, he he liked that so anyway um to now get back and ground ourselves back into uh nicholas he was uh, a, a sort of a proto-scientist or at least working with geometry to try to understand now what i said to you before we started our first conversation is i love the fact that nicholas von Kuse, um was a, a negative theologian and an apophatic uh, practitioner, which is part of my creole of how I try to map my reality. And um, that in itself, uh, like you said, did, could have earned him a trip to the stake, you know, to get too heavy into the negative uh, apophasis uh, of, you know, in other words, you know, rather than the devotional dogmatic rhetoric that you had to, you know, parrot um, time and again, I, I appreciate that about him, that he um, went really far with negative, um, you know, sort of reductive thinking in how can we understand that nature? Um, and do you think he fell into a panentheist um, ish kind of uh, position when he was talking about some of the more uh, deeply spiritual or, or spirit slash metaphysical interpretations of reality and, and so forth? Do you think he was heading in that direction? Or do you think he was sticking more in the confines of his you time? And argue, he went in the direction of immanence. Mm -hmm. So the okay. divinity is imminent, mm -hmm. and the divinity behind the world. But he clearly tried to take away the, the definition of what the divinity is from space-time, take it out of space-time mm -hmm. through negative theology. Now, negative theology doesn't mean that it's negative in the sense of being bad. Yeah. It means that instead of pointing out the properties of the divinity, what what properties the divinity has mm -hmm. you go out of your way to say what properties the divinity does not have what yep. the divinity is not yep. because every time you say the divinity the, the divinity is this you're excluding a whole lot of other things and and if the divinity is imminent in the whole then you can't do that you yep. have instead of putting boundaries through positive theology you have to remove boundaries by saying not this, not that, because every time you say it is this, you're putting a boundary. That's one of the big things he did, which was extraordinary for a Western scholar in the Middle Ages. Um, another thing he did, which I would praise him even more for, um, to, to put it in very un well un understandable language, is to highlight the limits of the intellect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is when he talked about access to insight through not knowing yeah through divine ignorance yeah um if i just use the words he used or literal translations from latin people will not understand what he means um, um and that's why i think he needs a treatment of, of the kind i attempted with jung mm -hmm. and, and, and schopenhauer uh, because if you just quote uh Von Kuse, uh out of context, you, you, you will not get it. Mm -hmm. You have to look at his corpus. Um, so yeah, I would praise him for that. I think he was extraordinarily subtle. He was extraordinarily capable of nuance for um, a philosopher that was bang in the middle, well, in the tail end of scholasticism. Mm -hmm. um, he was alert to <clears throat> empiricism well he was not an empiricist but he was sensitive mm -hmm. to what the senses inform us about the world um, he had a sensitive for mathematical modeling uh, which if 
we look at what he did and his attempts to model the solar system, you'd say, okay, scientifically, that's just very naive and silly. But you have to understand that this is a guy from the 1400s. Yeah. Uh, and and what context he was in and how much he could transcend um, that context. context. He single-handedly overcame scholasticism. That's a very big thing to say. It's like saying of someone today, he single-handedly overcame materialism. It's a big challenge. It's not easy when that's the world mm -hmm. that you are in. And the man <clears throat> was a bishop. You know, he, he was as close to scholasticism as, as one could be in, in, yeah. in the 15th century. So <clears throat> I think there is untapped wisdom. Um, and it's un in his case, it's even more serious than Jung and Schopenhauer, because we have a lot of material from Jung and Schopenhauer. They're closer to us in time. Their language is closer to us. Von Kuhs wrote in Latin. Mm -hmm. um, and most of his work is not translated into English, uh, only into German. Oh, okay. Uh, and most of the scholars that study von Kuhs today can read him in Latin. So they don't even bother. They don't need the German. Yeah, they don't want that. It creates an extra layer of uncertainty uh, in between. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I think if we could bring his ideas alive today, uh, we would realize that there was a treasure buried in the backyard of the Western in inheritance. We just have to dig it out. Yeah, yeah. And again, to emerge from scholasticism the way he did, um, I know there were realists within, I was reading something, what was his name, Scotus or the Scottish? Uh, uh, John was, Scotus Eriana. John, John Scotus, who was sort of grounded in a... Uh, a that was much uh, earlier. That was centuries before. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm saying that 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 what he, what he wrote about oh, yeah, yeah, as yeah. a materialist and a realist, I'm not putting... Um, uh, uh, Nicholas von Kuhs in a contraposition or, or, or a contradictor. I'm just saying that this is just, just an accent to what scholasticism um, was contributing in a sense. Yeah. It, it may have been too uh, obscure to, to say, but I wanted to just bring no, that I up. No, I understand there. you. Uh, yeah. John, de Scott, uh, John de Scott would be another one burned at the stake if he, if he were around uh, during the, the Counter-Reformation. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. My friend, uh, uh, who was the lady that I spoke of earlier, uh, Marie Poiret, she didn't do so well. She got burned. She, she was burned at the stake for heresy because she was a Beguine and, and there was a fragile relationship between the French uh, Catholics, uh, you know, the establishment and, and the Beguines anyway. And she refused to renounce. You know, she just, uh, no, I'm not. And she went to the stake for it, which I had, that's one of the reasons I admire her a lot. Um, Anyway, um, okay, let me let me gather my thoughts because uh, I don't want to take too much. I, I love taking your time, but I have to be respectful. Um, <laughs> let's see, because we, I can always invite you back in a year and we can we can have more conversations if you're willing. Um, let me, I want to prioritize. Um, I, I pinned something that Matt had said and I do, I want to address that. And then this may be too deep of a well to dip into today, but I want to talk about because, um, again, your conversation with Jonathan Peugeot was really nice. And um, and I I look for like him, like a non dualist interpretation of Christianity. I look for reformation, um, trying to pop its head up, a second reformation of Christianity, trying to emerge from the otherwise stagnant dogmatism. Um, I don't know. If, for a moment, let's talk about something that said but he did it from a guarded position of agnosticism but i've other people have talked about your work and said and they're they're sympathetic to a point but then they go uh, like ian mcgilchrist said this um pointedly that oh, oh oh no i don't go that far i believe there is you know a reality out there and yada 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 i'm sorry that was a terrible ian mcgilchrist but he he basically said and and um and John Verbeke, of course, says this, and, and they all sort of cling. And this just, just could be very simple. It's just the, 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 the sort of not wanting to let go of, of our history kind of thing and dogma. But can we, without taking too much of your time, try to offer a synthesis position for these folks that are stubbornly kind of not interpreting what you mean? So in other words, when they hear consciousness is the ontological primitive, they're like... You know, there's a Himalayan mountain of bullshit of New Age stuff that's you know fighting against you when when you know fighting against that idea. 
that's one thing. There's also the resistance to say, well, that means that real stuff doesn't exist. And, you know, how, and, and there are discrete packets of, you know, materiality or whatever, you know, whatever the thought is. Um, and again, this might have to be a whole nother conversation, but I, I get a little frustrated when I hear people say that because I kind of get what you're saying. I get what you're saying to a point um, about how we can reconcile the core layer of subjectivity um, or field of subjectivity and the fact that we occupy a real world of tangible assets and tangible things, but it's there, there's explanation there. And, and God knows you've explained this countless times, but like, let's say you were in a room with five people who were kind of confused in the sense, like a, with the, what consciousness is B what materiality is. And, um, how there can be reconciliation, like the like the Whiteheadian interpretation where they try to throw a lifeline to materiality. But I grant Whiteheadian thinking that they don't go the route of the materialist. They they have a whole other species of um, what the relation their relational and their uh, materiality. I don't know if I just opened something up that shouldn't even be talked about right now because a you've talked about it so much and b. Um, that could be another hour and a half to two hour conversation. And I don't want to put you through that today, but I, I it's are, something no, I already asked the question. I so did. Let's, and let's, I did. And I did go. it out of frustration. <laughs> I know I did it out of frustration and I did it as I, I, you know, my access to you is limited. And so let's do that. And then maybe we can finish with a little bit of talk about um, the future of Christianity. You said I, Matt and Ian, do you mean Matt Siegel and Ian McGilchrist? Yeah, Ian McGilchrist, Ian McGilchrist had said something once in an interview, and they asked about idealism, not you per se. So we could be talking about a spectrum of idealism here where, you know, blah, 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 um, whether it's subjective idealism a la uh, Barclay or, you know, absolute idealism or your analytical idea. I don't know. So it's not fair to Ian to say that. But I absolutely love and respect uh, Dr. McGilchrist's work. He's on the Essentia Foundation. Um, he's a contributor to what you guys do. But I just... I. I, I'm wondering what's causing him to think that through countless explanations that you've provided, um, and 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 I and I'll cite John Verveke for that because he he absolutely respects your work and he absolutely respects you as a human being. But it's like there's this hanging on to something. Um, maybe it's not a satisfying explanation that you provide, or maybe it's just a misunderstanding. So anyway, yeah, okay, let's let, let's address yeah, let, this. Let's then. give you some space because I've been running my so, mouth for three minutes. Sorry. So <laughs> Analytic idealism makes a direct, unreserved recognition that there is a real world beyond us, which would be there whether we are here to look at it and experience it or not, which doesn't care about wh what we think of it, whether we fantasize that the world should be different, whether we like the world or not. That world is insensitive to any of this. It is objective from our perspective, in the sense that we cannot change the reality of the world just by wishing it to be different. So under analytic idealism, there is really a real world that does not depend on observation, does not depend on us, and doesn't care what we think of it. But that world is mental, just like my inner life is mental. And that there can be mentation outside our individual mentation is absolutely trivial. I believe your thoughts exist. From my point of view, your thoughts are objective. I cannot change your thoughts merely by wishing them to be different. Mm -hmm. And if I were not around, you would still have thoughts. The existence of your thoughts does not depend on me. And yet, they are subjective from their own point of view. Your thoughts are mental stuff, just like my thoughts are mental stuff. But your thoughts are not in my mind, my individual, personal mind. Now, in exactly the same way, what idealism says, analytic idealism, is that the world is made of transpersonal mental processes. They are processes that are not ours, just like your thoughts are not mine. They are really out there, just like your thoughts, from my perspective, are really out there. And they are subjective, just like your thoughts are subjective, even though from my perspective, they are objective. So that's all that analytic idealism says. There is a real world, objective from our perspective, but that world is mental and subjective from its own perspective. 
And no, we cannot change the world merely by making affirmations or, or, or hoping that it, uh, it will be different tomorrow. No, the sun will rise tomorrow, even if you affirm the whole night that there shall be no sun tomorrow. It will still come up. And it will be what, whatever it is, regardless of whether we believe it or not. It will still be subjective, even if we don't believe that it can be subjective. <laughs> And it will still exist, even if we think that there cannot be such a subjective field of mentation outside ourselves. Now, the problem is that culturally, we have been indoctrinated into association, associating mentation with life. So we think mentation, mind stuff, can only exist within a head. And analytic idealism does not make this assumption, because that would be begging the question. That would be assuming an answer for the very question that you want to answer in the process of arguing for your answer. It's like saying um, the Bible is true because it was written by God and God is true because the Bible says so. Well, that's begging the question. That's a yeah. form of circular reasoning. Yeah. And, and for us to try to approach the question of the nature of reality by assuming that minds can only exist within heads, that's a form of begging the question. You're assuming something that you're actually trying to answer. You're assuming it in your answer. In other words, you're not answering anything. You're just prejudiced. Uh, if we understand that mind is an ontological category, it's a type of existence <clears throat> and not the thing that happens within heads, then we can understand that the world can really be real. It can really be out there and it can be mental. It can be of the type, the same type as our inner life but not the same instance of that type as our inner life. It's mentation, but it's not my mentation or your mentation. Now, what is the physical world? What is the colloquially physical world? The forms and colors and shapes that we see around us. Well, that's our dashboard representation of the actual world that is out there. The, pro the mental processes that are playing out in nature. When we observe those mental processes, we automatically make a representation of that measurement, of that observation that is displayed to us as the colloquially physical world, as the bot metal bottle of water. This metal bottle of water is a representation in my dashboard of a transpersonal mental process that is out there. And it looks to me like this because evolution constructed a dashboard to limit my inner entropy and to favor my survival. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't <clears throat> represent the world exactly as it is. Why would it? That would be a catastrophe in terms of survival. So it has evolved to codify the states of the world before presenting those states to me. So to limit my inner entropy and, and benefit my ability to react timely and correctly to environmental challenges. And therefore, that transpersonal mental process out there presents itself to me as a metal bottle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The metal bottle is not the reality as it is in itself. It's my cognitive representation of that reality that has allowed my species to survive. But there is something out there that corresponds to the metal bottle. There is the thing that exists behind and beyond representation. What that is, we can't say because all we have is the representation thereof. If nobody were here around, if there were no conscious beings, there would be no bottle because the bottle is a representation of living conscious beings. But the thing that is represented as the bottle, that would still be there, regardless of if there is anybody looking at it or not. Mm -hmm. So when we ask, would the moon be there under idealism if we are not looking? It depends on what you mean by moon. If what you mean by moon is a silvery disk in the night sky, in other words, that, that content of perception, then it would not be there. Because that silvery disk in the night sky is an indication of dials in a dashboard. If the dashboard is not there, there are no dials. There is no indication. There is no representation. But the thing that is measured and represented by the dashboard as the silvery disk in the sky, that would still be there. If you want to call that the moon, then that would still be there. You see the point? Yes, yes. And that's what a lot of people do not understand uh, 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 in idealism, because we associate idealism with Bishop Barclay, who is famous for the, the tenet, to be is to be perceived, mm -hmm. which, if interpreted literally, <clears throat> is false. 
is a fallacy. The thing that corresponds to the moon would be there, whether it's perceived or not. The world, as it is in itself, is there, whether we look at it or not. But the moon, as a representation on the dashboard, can only exist if there is somebody looking. Because the moon is a content of looking. If nobody is looking, then that content has nowhere to be. So when Bishop Barclay says to be is to be perceived, that is correct only if we say that about the physical world. Because in my view, the physical world is a representation. It's what arises from measurement. And 40 years of foundations of physics is telling us exactly that mm -hmm. experimentally. Mm -hmm. um, so for the physical world to be is to be perceived. But the thing that is measured in order to lead to the physical representation that is perceived, that thing that is measured does not need to be perceived to be. But it is not physical either, because physicality is the result of an observation, the result of a measurement, and it arises from that. So for the physical world to be is to be perceived. For the world as it actually is, the world that is really out there, really independent of us, it doesn't care whether we perceive it or not. It is what it is. It doesn't give a damn. Would you say that, <clears throat> this might go back earlier to this um, uh, liminal space that I was asking about, um, the mind at large um, or the um, underlying field of subjectivity, which is probably my preferred term, but anyway, the under, that, that which is, um, it is at once non spatiotemporally bound and pregnant with potential it is it is sort of the phase of uh wave before particle if that's a good metaphor um and so in the inaccessible reality beyond the dashboard um and things existing in of themselves the thing uh what was it count the the thing in itself um the noumena. The noumena. The, this is where language falls apart for a dummy like me. Um, just to say that it, it, it exists in its own right. Um, but then we also talk about the fact that the underlying field of subjectivity, I would, so in other words, I'd see it existing as potential or as a, in a phase of, um, to, to go quantum -y for a second, a phase of uh, a wave state or a vibration or a field. Um, that is, that is what the metal or the moon, the metal uh, drink can that you have or the moon is in potential um, as, a prob as a probability of collapse then is measured. I mean, so I'm trying to weave um, a quantum perspective into this, like, yeah. like, and we can't bridge quantum to where we are here, but I'm, I'm just trying to expand this out just a little bit more maybe for the hard heads that want to. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, the wave function, as uh, Schrodinger's equation has come to be known in popular culture, that wave function is our model of the world prior to an observation. Mm -hmm. It isn't the world. It's the best of our knowledge about the world prior to observation. It encapsulates and embody our best attempt to say something about that which exists prior to an observation. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it reflects a potential for physicality because physicality is the result of measurement. And if you model that which is there before measurement as the wave equation, then you're codifying the potential for what you might get once you make an observation. But that doesn't mean that the world as it actually is, is just potentials and has no definite reality. It's just our inability to model it completely in a deterministic fa fashion mm -hmm. that we see back in quantum physics. I don't think the wave function, Schrodinger's equation, is an ontic entity, mm -hmm. that, okay. that it is the world. <clears throat> I see the wave function as an epistemic tool. Okay. It's the best of our knowledge of the world. It, it encodes our expectations about what we would experience if we looked at the world. But it isn't the world. It's a model thereof. Mm -hmm. It's our limited human model thereof. 
So from that perspective, my the view I'm expressing is in line with relational quantum mechanics and with cubism, uh, other quantum Bayesianism approaches, yeah. which regarded the weight function as epistemic and not ontic. Mm -hmm. um, I am tempted to to think that from its own perspective, um, the mind of nature, that which is there, that which is measured before we get to the physical world as a result of the measurement, from its own point of view, it has a very concrete, defined reality. Um, in the same way that um, even when you are in doubt, like you got a job offer, and you don't know whether you should accept the job offer or not, and you have that cognitive dissonance in your in your mind, mm -hmm. uh, you don't know what decision to take, even that cognitive dissonance is a definite state, distinguishable from knowing what you want to do. You see, even mm -hmm. the doubt is definite in mm -hmm. the sense that it's differentiated from the absence <clears throat> of doubt. So I would say from its own perspective, even if the mind of nature is entertaining many doubts and questions, its existence is definite as such. From its own perspective, it is what it is. There is nothing woo-woo, quantum indeterminacy about it from its own perspective. The okay. quantum indeterminacy is our ability to know it mm -hmm. from our perspective. Mm -hmm. That's how I see this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I am a lot more conservative than a lot of people working in foundations of physics today. These guys are off to the races talking about aliens having created the Big Bang. And, and I don't know how many invisible dimensions and, and uh, particles flying back in time for which you have no empirical evidence and, 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 and uh, undetermined uh, 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 hidden variables. Many worlds and things like that. And many yeah. worlds and yeah. quantum <laughs> parallel universes <laughs> popping out every fraction of a second for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, but that, I am old fashioned. I think there is a world. It's definite from its point of view. It's really there. It doesn't care whether we measure it or not. It's just that it's not physical. If we if we abandon this prejudiced link between reality and physicality, everything will fall into place without needing to entertain gushing fantasies, yeah. which is what a lot of physics is doing today. We yeah. just have to part with this flawed association that whatever is real in itself has to be physical. No experiment has been telling us for 45 years that physicality does not have standalone existence. It's the uh, outcome of measurement. To circumvent that, we have to entertain fantasies that make the new age look reasonable. Yeah, so yeah. Let's not do that. Let's just realize that physicality is just what it seems to be. It's the result of measurement. It's a dashboard representation. The thing that's measured is not physical in the sense of not being exhaustively describable through quantities alone. Mm -hmm. It has a qualitative aspect to it. We all know that that's the case. What's the length in centimeters of our thoughts? What's the weight in grams of our emotions? Mm -hmm. Well, what's out there is of the same kind. And it's therefore not describable through physical quantities. Therefore, it's not physical. It's the thing that is measured to lead to the qualities of experience that we call physicality, which we then describe with physical quantities. Physical quantities are a description of, the, of a representation of reality. It's two steps removed from reality. Mm -hmm. First, you have reality. Then you have a physical representation of reality that arises upon measurement, meaning the colors and shapes uh, of perception. And then you describe the contents of perception. You describe the physical stuff with quantities. But what we do instead, we say that quantities are, are, are what is measured. And of course, no surprise we are so confused. No surprise we now feel that we have to entertain fantasies again that make the new age look reasonable. Uh, in foundations of physics, mm -hmm. because we are married to to a a, 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 a sort of a, a, a an equation that is obviously untrue. Reality does not equal physicality. Mm -hmm. Physicality is a representation of reality, and physics is a description of the representation. Yeah. If people really understand this, they can stick to their core intuitions about about reality. There is a world out there independent of us. It's really there. Okay. And the, the results of experiments in physics are not denying that. They are not denying an object world. They are just denying that such an object world is physical. That's 
all we need to understand for everything to fall into place. But we prefer the the, the obscurantist, unfathomable, empirically unverifi unverifiable fantasies than to review a trivially refutable metaphysical prejudice. I know you've explained all this exhaustively, and so I want to thank you for just, you know, packing this into our conversation. And um, and there's more behind uh, that you could continue to talk about, um, again, like the schism of the, uh, you know, the age of enlightenment and et cetera, et cetera. But so thank you. Um, and um, oh, oh, for uh, quantum Bayesianism, there's a guy on YouTube called Christopher Fuchs. If you're curious about quantum Bayesianism, he's I, I know Chris. Yeah. Yeah. He's got some good work. And and he yeah. actually he actually mentions uh, Whitehead in one of his things. But it's about sort of just using it as a metaphor, not like taking some of that seriously, but like the prehension and, and some other uh, Whiteheadian term. And also he has a great video on um, a revision of the double slit. And it's a uh, non-orthogonal double double measurement device that's active or inactive. You know, it's, it's just it's fun how he plays with it. I don't understand all the, you know, the the uh, equations, but he's a, that's a great channel. And uh, quantum Bayesianism has been attractive to me intuitively, just as a means of understanding the ground floor. And uh, so anyway, thank you for that. Um, because it's frustrating, uh, because people will say, oh, it's a, you know, I, I don't think it, you know, it's a dream, or, you know, all the other uh, baggage that's been attached to idealism. And, you know, I idealism is like anything else. It's been a ball that's been kicked around by a lot of people. Um, you've come along in the last 15, 20 years or however long and and really brought it back to uh, a proper place, I believe, of um, being grounded in uh, so in, in, in honesty and uh, in rigor and all these kind of things. And so um, anybody who tries to conflate what you do, again, with the Himalayan mountain of shit that um, some some other people do with the words like quantum and all this other stuff, that, that needs to be put to rest. And again, um, you know, I, I hope, and this is, again, the mission that you're on, that um, that the, the, the glacier will slowly <laughs> shift towards uh, something in between the silliness, like you said, of the contrived, uh, abstruse thinking um, that has to be done, the contortions that have to be done to preserve something as insignificant as discrete packets of materiality being there you know and so so um no, they are there but uh, after measurement <laughs> they are right, not the thing that right. is measured yeah. right so map territory you know those these kind of analogies and so so do you think um bringing donald hoffman back into the conversation he likes to talk about the amplitude hedron and these sort of markovian uh dynamics and things um do you think there's a way to peek behind the dashboard is that what he's doing is he trying to really because you had a conversation with him again i forget who the host was i'm so sorry uh where you guys were talking about is like is this quantifiable is this something that can be done through mathematics to understand maybe a little bit more about um the um the underlying field of subjectivity to a degree or to, and and as donald says we could spend uh you know ten thousand years rolling through uh crunching the math and crunching the uh, logic and um just not even move a nanometer and but it would be an accomplishment you know so it's all temper what i just asked by saying that so but do you think um you know there is any way to break through in that or is it not even worth it like for me it's not you know i don't need to know the mystery i just need to function um and and be the best conduit that i can <laughs> and get along with my dime on like you talk about we have a tremendous drive towards closure we want to have closure because nature is not as we would like it to be mm -hmm. Uh, there is suffering and there's nothing we can do about it. We suffer, everybody suffers, animals suffer, and it seems to be, you know, woven into the fa very fabric of nature that there is suffering. We don't like that. We can change it. So the next best thing is to understand it. Closure. And we are driven by the psychological need to find closure. And that's what motivates a lot of science, uh, including a lot of relatively abstract uh, science. So that, that drive, you're not going to change. We will always try to achieve closure. That's what ne egos need as the next best thing to ruling the universe, mm -hmm. making things exactly as the egos want. No, egos yeah. can't do that. So maybe at least they can understand it. We will never, as humans, as homo sapiens sapiens, I don't think we will ever overcome this. Um, so I don't think it is useless to try to model reality outside space-time because basic science is screaming to us that um, 
space and time are not fundamental. They are not an objective sc scaffolding of the world out there. Mm -hmm. Space and time are the the scales of the dials in the dashboard. And that's something Kant already said in the 18th century. Space and time are cognitive constructs. Schopenhauer repeated that. And neuroscience seems to be coming to the same conclusion that time is a subjective thing. And physics has now discovered that yet yeah, time cannot really be absolute. Otherwise, we cannot reconcile general relativity with quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to reduce space-time. Well, if, if, if you do that for time, then you have to do that for space, because we know that space-time are two aspects of the same thing. You know, in a black hole, space or time can turn into space and the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we have now happening in loop quantum gravity, the attempt to model nature outside space-time or from the perspective of eternity, as uh, as uh, Spinoza would have put it. Okay. Because eternity is that which is outside time, not that which lasts forever. And that's a common misunderstanding. Eternity is not that which lasts forever. Eternity is that which does not last because it's not in time. Mm -hmm. And And now... Consider theoretical considerations are pointing very strongly to the conclusion that uh, the foundational level of nature indeed is outside space-time. So we have to contemplate nature from the perspective of eternity, like Spinoza was arguing back in the 17th century, mm -hmm. not far away from where I am right now. Um, I think that is valid, but I think we have to be very careful in doing that because science is fundamentally grounded on empirical experimentation. And empirical experimentation happens within the language of space-time and the framework of space-time. We go to a lab and you run an experiment and we make measurements. Even when you're talking about the Higgs boson, which can never be measured directly because it decays too quickly, we still directly measure the muons, the bottom quarks, the W and Z boson, uh, when they interact with a scintillating tile and that signal gets multiplied by a photo multiplier and a multiplier and is eventually displayed on a computer screen. So it's it's grounded in experimentation, the notion of the Higgs boson, because it's within space time. It's a particle that at some point exists close to the collision point inside the onion that is a detector and then decays into other particles that follow specific trajectories within that onion most of which we can track and we can measure the pattern of energy deposition on a measurement surface that happens when that particle interacts with a measurement surface or goes through the measurement surface. So you, we can bring it down to spatial temporal language and ground it in experimentation. But when we try to model things from the perspective of eternity, like loop quantum gravity is trying to do, you become at least one more step removed from experimentation. And now experimental confirmation is completely indirect. You have to compute the implications of your theorizing in eternity back into space-time mm -hmm. and indirectly see whether experiments are aligned with that or not. Mm -hmm. It becomes very difficult to falsify stuff. It becomes very difficult to definitively prove stuff. Um, and we have to be very careful with that because now we are, we are on the edge of what the scientific, scientific method allows us to do. And if we go too far in that direction, then the work becomes mathematical philosophy, mm -hmm. which is okay. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's important stuff. But we shouldn't attribute to it the confidence we attribute to the discovery of the Higgs boson, which is higher than one in a million. It's a three sigma deviation result, which now I think it's already at five sigma. So it's a high degree of certainty and which philosophical speculation can never have. We can be fairly certain of metaphysical options that are untenable, like materialism. Materialism, 100% yeah. certainty, it's false. Right. Um, <clears throat> but we can never be absolutely sure about the thing that is true. Mm -hmm. Because the monkey is running around a rock. Yeah. How can we be sure that our understanding of nature is absolutely correct? Yeah. And we can still live informed by, by mathematical philosophy as the most tenable option on the table. So of all the stories we have, we choose one which is the most tenable or the least untenable. And we live according to it. But that's something other than scientific proof. 
And I know some philosophers even dispute whether there can be such a thing as scientific proof at all, that there is always uncertainty. I understand the argument, but even in that case, I would still make a distinction in the level of certainty we can have. So we, we should look at nature from the perspective of eternity and try to model that which lies behind space-time, but we have to be extraordinarily careful with attributing the weight and the confidence of the scientific methods to that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we cannot do it. I'm saying <clears throat> that we have to be extraordinarily careful in any attempt to do that. You know, the point of view of eternity is not trivial, and it's certainly not directly refutable or confirmed, confirmable through the scientific method, uh, which unfolds within space-time. And thank you for that. Um, that that's a, a good way to round out um, what was a concern of mine. <laughs> Again, from I I I don't watch television anymore. I just sit and watch countless conversations and dialogues and things. <laughs> and sometimes, again, the either you come up or the idealism thing comes up. And um, so, thank you for just attaching some rigor to that, um, because uh, not that I plan to go, uh, you know, on a horse and defend uh, idealism myself, but um, it just gives me something to. Uh, to digest. And, you know, you, you hit on something twice that um, has become a recent pet peeve of mine. <laughs> and so that we are little monkeys running around on an insignificant speck in an insignificant, you know, a, a banal galaxy. And we also call ourselves homo sapiens sapiens, as you just said a moment ago. And I kind of threw that out myself as a cynic. And I, I call us uh, homo technensis right now, uh, because we are a technology ape. Um, and and I am going to have the privilege of speaking with Mark Vernon next week, and he has a, in his book, um, the new book that he came out uh, on spiritual intelligence, Seven Steps, that uh, he calls us homo spiritualis, which I Great love. Book, That's, by the way. Great oh, book. Oh, I'm halfway through it. Yes. I, 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 it's a PDF, and I've just been highlighting the shit out of it. And I'm just like, I can't wait for that conversation. But anyway, to get back to what I was saying. Are we a sapiential agent yet? I mean, to me, it's fleeting. It rises and falls. So I'm talking about the whole species. It, it, it rises and falls. There are there are little sparkles of uh, optimistic uh, grounding in this. But were we premature in calling ourselves Homo sapiens? Would it be wiser to say wiser to say <laughs> Homo technensis because we have done one thing really well, and that is to be a technological creature, whether it was ten thousand years ago or now, or you know, pottery to now, you know. Um, what do you think? I mean, do we deserve Homo sapiens just yet? <laughs> this is cynical. If I, if, if I were to be cynical, I would say, well, it's just a name, you know, yeah, call it hex. Yeah. Homo hexiensis. And I mean, it's fine. It's just yeah. a name. Who cares? Hexian. Of course, there's a lot of hubris uh, embedded uh, in I'm that saying. nomenclature. Yeah. And we coined um, it at a time when we were very hubris, hubristic, like, you know, you talk about logical positivism and, the, and that mid 19th century and Auguste Comte and all this kind of you know intellectual yeah and the whole notion bombacity. of man as yeah. distinct from the beast yeah, and, yeah. Uh, very 19th century nonsense <laughs> yeah. yeah um so yeah i think you are you are strictly um correct i i don't bother too much about it because ultimately yeah, yeah. it's just a name but if you look at the history of humanity everything we thought we knew in the past now we know was wrong <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, just about everything but now we think oh now we got it right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, yeah all right <laughs> okay okay yeah i just wanted to get your tuppence on that because i just i sit and i think when i have time on my hands and i love botany and horticulture and the taxonomy that that is embedded in that and so for 30 years i've been a plant freak and there's great value to the species name and sometimes it's honorific like there's a lot of i i follow palms more than anything because i live in florida and it's neat because again speaking to that time period a lot of the species names on some of the older classifications are honorifics to prussian kings and uh princesses and so you know you have all these fancy um friedrichsoniana and things like that you know that's just honorific so i i, I too tend to put a weight on on species identification but it's because of my love for uh horticulture and botany that that i just kind of look at us now and i say because i like homo technensis i mean that's just well we're we should be proud of the fact that we you and i are looking at funny little plastic things and we're having this amazing conversation even though you're uh, probably three thousand miles or 2500 miles from me and so i grant that all is just absolutely amazing but i do hope sapiential nature uh becomes more um static in our being so anyway uh, not to get on another soapbox you know bernardo i've had you for probably close to three hours so i might 
I had one other thing I was going to ask. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is very trivial, but I just want to throw it out and then maybe we can wrap it up because I don't want to keep you beyond three hours because you're so generous with your time. And I want to acknowledge that again to the uh, to you and to the YouTube audience. When I when I listen to you talk, this is going to be kind of weird. So uh, roll with me if you could. And you have this fondness for, for um, the history of our thinking and our development of ideas. Um, it leads to a question your love for Schopenhauer and um, in this conversation, we had Nicholas von Kuse and so forth. Um, and there's this, there's this attachment um, to these personalities in this, what I called earlier a collaboration. Do you think there's permeability in this, um, if we could call it an archival nature of human experience? So those, and you've said this before, like it's, uh, and, and this may have been a Jungian reference, like, you know, we owe it to our ancestors uh, or, or something to that effect. Do you think, and I look at you as an example, because you are deeply connected to the Weimar intellectuals and to the certain uh, points in history, um, that there is this permeability, this mm, not quite two-way street, but just this attachment, to, not just literally, like you can go open a book and read it, but just that artifact or that residue of the mind that has been here before us. So, so I know that's really weird and I'm not invoking anything supernatural by saying that. I just, I think if we think that it is all mind, that there's gotta be ways that we just aren't aware of. So anyway, I'll hand that off to you, you and you can do whatever you want with it because, because that's what I get from you. And, and, and again, I'm not being woo woo. I'm just like, you embody certain things when you get interested in them. So you, and it's not you, it's just not the physical body that's Bernardo. It is just the mind of Bernardo has again relationality that's kind of the quasi theme of this thing and so anyway if you want to take that well, and that'll course. be our last then, our parting thought of course there is <sighs> permeability uh, we live in the presence of the ancestors jung would say this is an empirical fact whatever your philosophy your philosophy is just your philosophy but there mm. are facts there are psychological facts uh, objective psychological facts he would have put it this way and one of these psychological facts is that the ancestors stand right here behind our mm -hmm. shoulders mm -hmm. looking over our shoulders if you have the sensitivity to pick that up it's, it's right there it's uh, i'm not saying that they exist still as individuated segments of mind yeah, yeah. that schopenhauer is really there in some <laughs> yeah. this, in this corporeal form what i mean is that the psychological dispositions the questions raised the tentative answers arrived at, the cognitive contents of previous minds are, are out there. They, they don't disappear because the dissociation ends. They are just released into a broader cognitive context. And they have a certain reactivity, just like molecules can undergo, or, or atoms and molecules can undergo chemical reactions in which they bind or, mm -hmm. or unbind and absorb mm -hmm. or release energy. You can use that metaphor for uh, psychic contents mm -hmm. or cognitive contents. They are reactive. And when cognitive contents with similar dispositions come in the same cognitive neighborhood, they tend to react and attach and form chains and form links. And one of those links in the Western tradition uh, is German idealism. Mm -hmm. and, and I am right there. Uh, it's it's my lived reality. Uh, it's the those are the dispositions, the questions, the tentative answers that stand here behind my shoulders, looking over what I'm doing, to see if we together can take it one step further. And one day, I will be looking over yeah. the shoulder of yeah. whoever else comes in that chain of cognitive reaction. Mm that uh, is trying to lead nature in a direction that will tackle one of the fundamental spontaneous questions of nature. Yeah. Um, I, I, this is my lived reality. This, mm -hmm. uh, the pressure of the ancestors looking over my shoulder that is partly what I call the diamond. Yeah, yeah. It is that, that force that was, once was embodied in a personal segment of mind and now is impersonal. Mm -hmm. but it's out there it's surrounding <clears throat> us it's part of that objective world in which i am inserted in which i represent as the physical world but uh, that those those tendencies those psychological dispositions uh, just just press through me and, and 
you know, it's 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 not. They are not me. They are not Bernardo Castro. Bernardo Castro is yeah. just an image, just a face. Yeah. Um, I am. I, I'm speaking mythical language here, so your audience has to bear with me because I was just talking about the Higgs boson and suddenly <laughs> yeah. I, I move over to mythical language shift. and psychology. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe too 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 hard a turn uh, hey, for most you've people. Got a, you've got a smart audience; they'll 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 shift with you. <laughs> yeah, bear with me. Um, I'm, I'm speaking mythical language, but uh, to me. I don't need to argue this. I don't need to convince anybody of this. And that's not my trip. I'm I'm arguing for, for idealism, mm -hmm. not for what you just referred to. What you just referred to is it's my lived everyday reality. Mm. It's preposterous to even argue for or against it. It's a yeah. given fact. It's, okay. it's you know, it's with me while I sleep. Um, it's it wakes up with me, and it, it, it's what shapes my life, shapes my world. It's what gives meaning to my existence mm -hmm. uh, as this this little form. Um, even the question: Is it really real? <laughs> yeah, it is real, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's uh, it has a very primary reality that uh, that cognitive chain exists and it's the chain that chains me to the servitude that mm -hmm. is my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and at some point i rebelled against this chain i wanted to break it so it's a metaphorical chain in the sense that one thing le leads to another that the links fall together in a line it's that but it's also a chain in the sense that it binds and bounds um, and restricts. Um, Bernardo Castro would like to be designing computers day and night, mm -hmm. and not do anything else. But I am bound. I'm. I am not free. Well, actually, I am free in in servitude. F freedom comes from servitude towards the impersonal, and that's what uh, that's also what I meant in our previous conversation when I was talking about not taking yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, that means admitting or acknowledging that life is sacrificial. It's a phenomenon of servitude. Mm -hmm. And in my case, it's extremely clear, right and explicit that my servitude is to the ancestors. And they get pretty mad if I'm, if I'm not doing the work. Yeah. They're right here, and they're right here. They're, they're listening as I speak. It. <laughs> well, that's why you said in a recent interview, I think it was with Pajot, as a matter of fact, and he felt the draw, perhaps, of the of the diamond, and you were feeling your butt getting kicked by the diamond. So if they're behind you, that's a good strategic place to do a little butt kicking and get uh, Bernardo the um, servant to uh, to abide and do what is trying to come out of you in nature and not resisting uh, by wanting to go do what you want to do. And that, and so, and so there, I love tension and I love um, the functionality within tension. So, um, so there's, there's friction and then there's movement and, and there's tension and, and part of, I think, not to solve the world's problems or understand the meaning of life or anything like that, but to, to be comfortable with that environment of, um, acknowledging so so you you know when you stray away from it the suffering kicks up and when you're you know it's like warmer colder war, you know it's that yeah, kind yeah. of new one and i think that you know evolutionary growth in the mind of humanity if there's any such thing that i think that is what one thing you could point to is that and uh, you've been you've been talking about that lately and it's it's made a big impact on me because um and talk about reformation there needs to be a reformation in the self-help self-improvement uh arena and you've pointed to this a, n a number of times that there's just so much focus on narcissism and the ego and you know you can use your quantum activation elixir to um get the uh abundance that you're seeking and uh you know now now the healing trauma part i support you know people need to get through their stuff but the forward thinking thing like oh i'm going to manifest you know whatever the hell it is secrets and things like that um feels good but you know i think a greater way to um move forward with less friction and more in the flow which is we could invoke taoism in this thinking is that idea that if you just 
listen to the daimon and feel the impulses coming through you uh, that the daimon is is trying to uh, express and again i'm speaking mythologically too yeah. i'm not invoking real daimons but that yeah. idea that's the natural life of the human being but we mm -hmm. are very alienated from from natural life we we've replaced life with a narrative even you know the very notion of well-being in western culture has become synonymous with taking the reins of your life. That's what the whole self-help industry yeah. seems to be trying to do. Take yeah. responsibility for your happiness. Now, I, I understand the meaning and the, the appropriateness of this in a particular context where somebody has had a very weak ego and has lived the unlived life of his or her parents instead of their own lives uh, or, or does not have assertiveness enough to make their own life decisions and instead taking the cues from the partner or the boss. I understand that, but it's ultimately utterly unnatural because behind that notion that you have to take the reins of your life is the absolutely unnatural notion that your life's about you, which mm -hmm. we talked about in the previous conversation. Um, and And this is a thing of the left. I mean, most people would consider me left because uh for, for many valid reasons i i reject all labels including that or the label of the right but i am a conservative in the sense that i don't think we are born in a vacuum mm -hmm. that we are born without history without ancestors mm -hmm. that we can make of life whatever we, we, we want to make of it that life is about us that uh, we are tabula rasa and we can paint the painting of our own personality. I think this is all absolutely unnatural, untrue, and psychologically untenable mm -hmm. because it requires that you bear a responsibility and weight on your shoulder that no human being can possibly bear. We are not born out of time. We are not born without a history. We do have ancestors. Mm -hmm. We are the leading edge of an arrow that is very long. Uh, we are at the head of a train that is very long, very, very long, and it carries its own inertia. Uh, we may be the stewards of the train, but the train has inertia. We can't just mm -hmm. make a turn arbitrary to the left or to the right. Mm -hmm. That's unnatural. It's not what's going <clears throat> on psychologically, biologically, or physically. Um, and And the liberal left, I think, and they have control of the levers of power and have had in the neoliberal wor world for 150 years now, um, it seems to entertain, take very seriously, even for granted, this notion that we are born in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And I would submit to you that that's the origin of some evil but a lot of unnecessary self-inflicted suffering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it robs us of context, it robs us of meaning, it robs us of references, and it puts the weight of the world on the shoulder of a human being. We are not atlases. We can't carry the weight of the world. Um, so in that sense, I think as someone who is often labeled a neoliberal for admittedly good reasons, um, I, yeah, I, if I have an opportunity, I like to bring this subject up because I don't think that's what's going on. And mm -hmm. that, that's not how I live. Uh, I live at the head of a train and behind me, there is Schopenhauer, there is Jung, there is Kant, there is Hegel, there is Goethe, there is Fichte, uh, there's Schiller, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. And, and I, I, I can't just take the reins of that train and make a sudden turn 90 degrees to the right. It's not yeah. how it works. Yeah. Nor can <laughs> I pretend that the train trip is about me. How preposterous. How unspeakably preposterous yeah, right. to think that my life is about me. Yeah. Um, and there is a way to be free in servitude. Actually, it's the only way to be free is to be free in servitude, is to recognize that it's not about you. Yeah. It's never been, will never be, cannot be. 
that uh, you are at the, the, the edge of a process that precedes you and goes back behind the mists of time and prehistory. Mm -hmm. And that you are a tool at best. And you will be a good tool if you recognize that and a terrible tool if you try to fight against it. And you will suffer. And that there is profound freedom in servitude. Yeah, this is what I would like the neoliberal world to understand. Yeah. We don't well, call I... that conservatism anymore. We call it old fashioned now. Because conservatism yeah. now is has been equated with stupidity and fake news and alternative yeah. facts. <laughs> yeah. I can speak as an American that uh, it's unfortunate that conservative ideology has been hijacked and um, taken down a dark path uh, because I absolutely, and somebody got triggered in our last conversation last year that I was uh, picking on conservatism. And this young man um, opened a YouTube account and went to the length to kind of chide me and uh, you know, that I was, <laughs> that I was grousing uh, I think was the word he used and that nothing could be further than the truth because I live very conservatively. I think somewhat progressively, but I'm a synthesis person. I know that there are good ideas on both sides. And so a critique of the, uh, what you just said of, of liberal thinking and progressive thinking is that um, it can be too uh, too heady and too idealistic in an in a, in a, uh, ethical sense. And um, that we are creatures of habit. We are creatures of society. We are creatures of culture. And uh, and conservatism makes mistakes in the same regard. But, you know, again, if we can and I like to try to align myself in the center as a synthesis person. But, yeah, I, I agree with your critique that um, we can get too experimental uh, people living in ivory towers of academia who have these very lofty ideas of what utopia might be or what, you know, what good living might be. And with you, I'm with you in that sense that uh, we we have to be grounded in a certain kind of history and an, and uh, a sober and almost uh, religious, uh, in a good way, um, apprehension of that and appreciation. And it is a kind of religious experience. It is relegale, it is to rebind uh, to the past. And um, so without going transcendent. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so I agree with you. And, um, you know, uh, the idea of um, progress has to be tempered and conservatism has to know how to grow, right? So maybe that's how we can look at it. Uh, progress has to be grounded it doesn't happen in thin air yeah um what would be ideal would be to correct some basic misunderstandings i mean we we misunderstand things and we carry the misunderstandings as reality some basic things like a recognition of the mythical concept of destiny is often confused with determinism Mm. machine like mechanism like determinism incompatibilism and stuff they yeah. are not the same thing yeah actually they are compatible oh, no i'm referring to the staunch speaking. determinism yeah <laughs> i'm sorry yeah, yeah. yeah. but to rec to to have a sensitivity for the notion of destiny lot uh, does not mean that you have to be a physical determinist that you have that, that that you have to think that everything is physically determined. Actually, I think nothing's physically determined because physicality is a representation. I do think things are determined, but not uh -huh. physically determined. Uh, but the notion of destiny is a soft notion, uh, and it's compatible with either side of the determinism uh, debate. But uh, the you know the left tends to say, well, destiny means that you have no agency. Mm -hmm. And and therefore, if you have no agency, then there is no progress. And we don't like that. Well, I don't like that either, but it's not an implication of the concept of destiny that you have no, no, no agency. It's not at all what is meant by destiny. Destiny means a sensitivity to that which has passed before you. And, mm -hmm. and which you do serve as the next step in the dance of nature. Mm -hmm. as part of nature. But anyway, um, I don't want to go down this. Rabbit yeah. Hole. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. And, and, and again, if you have the time and the space and the inclination, I would love to have you back for another conversation, because I would like to expand on, um, I would like to enter into the way you're working with the Trinitarian Western Abrahamic systems and seeing uh, past the uh, fundamentalism, the dogma, the literal interpretations of things, allegory, which is a book you wrote, you know, that you can pick up and understand if you're out there in the YouTube audience. Um, so yes, let's let's hit pause on this. We again, I've had you for three hours, and that's certainly a very generous uh, giving on your part. And um, again, if you're inclined, I can bring you back uh, 
down the road and we can have a further conversation because uh yeah i could i could talk with you for a long time <laughs> it's a good thing sure. we don't live near each other because i'd be like hey let's go do lunch <laughs> it's probably a good thing we're separated by an ocean but so bernardo let's let's call this time uh a pause and um we will pick it up at, at a future point um and again i want to offer offer my deepest gratitude for your time and your thoughts your mind and sharing yeah, mind pleasure sharing mind with uh, with me and the audience. And to the YouTube audience, I'd like to thank you for, um, and your your followers will watch the entirety of, of these conversations. Uh, not, not all of them, but a lot of them will, because they like to uh, to pick up new new ideas that are coming or new things that are arising from conversations. So uh, to the YouTube audience, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Uh, not to solicit myself, but um, you know, if you enjoyed this, I would love a subscription and maybe uh, some thumbs up, thumbs down, doesn't matter. Just something to help the little bots uh, recognize this channel. I derive no revenue from this at all. It's a hobby. It's something I do as a uh, service, if you will. Uh, not the ego, Justin, but just trying to get these conversations into the public domain. So, hey, you know, any, anything you could do in that sense would be wonderful. So again, thank you guys. And Bernardo, thank you again publicly. I will say goodbye to you after we stop recording and uh, look forward to our next conversation in the future, sir. So do I. Thanks right. for having me, Justin. Absolutely. Bye, uh, bye YouTube audience.